what does psilocybin do? Great question. Well, <clears throat> psilocybin is a serotonin agonist. Serotonin is one of the neurotransmitters in, in the brain. And it um, activates those serotonin channels. And um, it's still quite controversial exactly how these um, psychedelics work. LSD is in the same class, what's considered a classic psychedelic. Um, but basically, they work to damp down some of the ruminative cycles that we all encounter in our... We all in, ruminate. We, we all, all ruminate, ruminate over the past and things that have happened to us and traumas. Our, our sort of ego-driven state of being, which is essential for survival, but it can become very dysfunctional over time. And it seems that uh, psychedelics, particularly psilocybin and LSD, when done in the proper setting with proper support and integration can break some of those cycles and can help people sort of break through to new understandings um, and new perceptions about how they're functioning and what they're, what they're doing wrong and what they can do, what they can do right. You know, this is, uh, this is exactly what happened to me. And, and I, I was watching one of your YouTubes and you talked about, the, you know, this ego dissolution um, event that happens, you know, disrupts the default mode network where we all worry about the future. We fret over the past. Uh, rumination, you know, occurs. We stay in this same, you know, like a, a one-legged duck swimming in circles just over and over again. Uh, psilocybin shuts that network down um, allows people to to get out of that rut, and it's this concept of neuroplasticity, right? I mean, you 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 get over this wall. I liken it to the scar tissue that just kind of we all gather from our experiences in life, and it's just hard to get over the wall. Psilocybin seems to break through that to where you can imagine and and feel and open your mind and open your heart uh, let in empathy let in love new meaning new perspective mm -hmm. and and it's that neuroplasticity where these are neural pathways that are new right that we we have not let the brain evolve what psilocybin does is actually let the brain grow yes very well said. And they're, all of the psychedelics are neuroplastogens, and they actually change the structure and the function of the brain. And so it happens transiently while you know people are, have their experience, say a four or five, six hour psilocybin journey. It damps down that default mode network, and it allows all these different parts of the brain that don't normally communicate to communicate. And through that, these, these new perspectives and these epiphanies can occur and it can allow people to deal with and cope with their problems, whether it's a drinking issue, it's terminal cancer, it's depression, it's anxiety. Um, and that's, that's how we think they work. And um, it's, a, it's a fascinating area that we still don't know a lot about. We don't know the, the functionality per se, but we're learning quite a bit through. So you don't these you don't know what what why why it does this. I mean that's the mystery, right? We say magic mushrooms. They're it, <laughs> but it, but they grow out of the ground. So you know maybe we're not maybe you and all of your incredibly smart colleagues are never going to know. We might not know, and you know consciousness is a is a mystery unto itself. And um, as to why we're conscious and how we became conscious beings, that's a, a huge mystery. And why these psychedelic compounds that are occur naturally in the in on the planet, why they impact our brain so fundamentally for these short bursts of time, that is a huge open question. Um, and part of the fun of of being a neuroscientist and a mental health researcher, uh, why this field is is so interesting right now. And to get government cooperation, do you have to know? I mean, these are data-driven people, right? So do, do you have to be able to explain to them, you know, why this, because, you know, in my mind, I, I just think this could help so many millions and millions of people. Right. I don't think the FDA cares so much about the mechanism per se. How do they actually work at a molecular level? They want some of that. They want to know that they're safe mm. and that they're effective um, and that appropriate precautions are taking are taken when they're given to individuals. I think that's really what the FDA is focused on, as they should be. So the um, community is focused on this as a medical, you know, uh, tool that people can use regularly or because, you know, taken into their own devices, we were talking, you can have a bad trip if you decide, oh, I'm just going to get a hold of psilocybin because it's legal now and I'm just going to take a whole bunch of them and I'm going to 
you may not be ready for what's coming, for what's going to be unearthed in, in your mind. Exactly. And so these are extremely powerful drugs, and they need to be taken seriously because people can have a really bad experience. They can have a damaging experience if they're not properly prepared um, and if they're, they don't have proper what we call integration afterwards, sort of the psychotherapy that goes on after the journey in which you try to integrate what you saw, what you experienced, and integrate that into your life going forward into the relationships you have. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's really a process of preparation being in the proper uh, setting, the set and setting with the individuals that are doing, that are, that are guiding you or facilitating, and then the sort of follow through. So it's a, it's a whole sort of container of care that goes beyond just say giving an antidepressant, take, take your Prozac every day. It's a completely fundamental shift in an approach to mental health. And, and I think it's, it's challenging for the FDA because they're used to looking just at drugs per se. They approve a drug for like hypertension or diabetes or lipids or for cancer. Um, but the reason for the success of psychedelics is the psychedelic assisted therapy because it's not done by itself. That's, that's the key thing. And I think the FDA is working through that of how they're going to do that. And, and it's, important for them to consider this because they did reject MDMA a year, a little over a year ago for PTSD, but there's new phase three trials that are coming through for both psilocybin and LSD for depression and anxiety. And hopefully those will be approved by the FDA, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah, I did have a, a, a viewer, listener of mine, you know, reach out to me on a direct message and say, you know, I m make sure you, that people understand that these have to be done in a setting that is, you know, intelligent, is, is well thought out because she shared that she, you know, left her husband and she did all these things that she did right away after a psilocybin journey. And she says that, you know, she's made terrible mistakes. And um, so that's real. Yeah. I mean, you that is real. And, and so um, people need to be counseled beforehand um, and also not to make any rash decisions immediately afterwards because it takes time for these things to sort of percolate and resonate in your mind to, to really see where, you know, what new direction you might want to go. You know, in the clinical trials that we're doing at Psychedelic Science Institute, we, um, these are, you know, all have a lot of rigor from the sponsors, the companies that produce the drugs and from the FDA and DEA. And it's very rigorous and very, you know, science driven. And the, and the evidence has to be um, produced in that way for the FDA to really look at the data and really determine whether a drug can be approved. Now, psychedelics were available in legal, right? In the 1940s and 1950s, way back and through and the 60s. 60s. And then in 1970, the Controlled Substance Act, right? I think that was Nixon. Um, and so they shut everything down. And it was down for almost 30 years. Yes. So, uh, you know, obviously, did the Timothy Learys of the world and the, and the, and the hippies of the 60s ruin the, the, the progress? Could we have been much further along without these, you know, great seekers? And I think people like... Timothy Leary, uh, Richard Alpert, who was, became Ram Dass, um, Ralph Metzner, they were part of the Harvard Psilocybin Project in 1960 to 63. And they initially had very good intentions. I think Timothy Leary uh, went off the reservation, so to speak, and, and thought it would be something that all of society should just have. And I think that's, that's where it really became a problem. And the government had a problem with the counterculture and they saw it getting into the troops, you know, the, the armed forces in Vietnam were doing not only psychedelics, but they were doing all sorts of other drugs. Um, and it just became unmanageable. And that's what they did. They shut it all down. Um, so it's unfortunate that that happened. Timothy Leary did actually do some good, though. He, he was, you know, he started a lot of things that have now continued um, and was a big focus big on set and setting this idea of your your mindset and, and how you do it and the setting that you're in mm. so some of that came from from him but yeah we lost um you know 30 years 20 20 years at least 
because the the first psychedelic research that began again in the 90s was with DMT and then MDMA and then psilocybin in the early 90s and it it's taken a long time to get to where we are now um, so we lost a couple decades for sure we're talking to Dr. Dan Kelly who uh, runs the Psychedelic Science Institute and we're talking about the medical uh, side of of psilocybin and psychedelics you know to treat um, depression, anxiety, uh, PTSD. Um, well, look, you, the psych, psychiatrists will prescribe SSRIs, you know, the Lexapros and the and the Prozacs. Um, so, big pharma has lots of money to make on SSRIs. Not to get all conspiracy theorist here, but <laughs> is that part of the holdup? Part of the resistance? is that farm, pharma can't make money off of things that grow into the, in the ground. I don't think we know that Big Pharma is trying to repress this or hold it back. Um, I think that the, the drug companies that are making um, the psychedelics like um, MindMed, Atai, Cybin, Usona, they're very small companies and they're working through the process um, but it's a hugely different model. The, the trials that we're doing now, for example, for major depression, the patient will take, the, it's a placebo-controlled trial, so they may get the real thing or they may, they, may, they may get the placebo, but after the first about 12 weeks, then they have four more opportunities over the course of a year to take a, a real journey with psilocybin because the FDA is interested in the durability of how long does the drug last and in which which particular patient. So you would go from taking an antidepressant every day to maybe having a journey once, twice, three times a year um, to manage your, your depression. And that's a very different business model, obviously, for the companies producing those, those drugs. So I don't know where it's going to go, but hopefully the science will lead to the best possible care for individuals suffering from anxiety, depression, addiction, PTSD, because that's, that's really what it should be. And I think the problem with SSRIs and drugs like that is it's basically suppressing your brain. It's basically tamping your brain down. Right. It's dulling you down. It's a complete, the, the it's psychedelic- not healing. It's treating, it's, it's not healing. Exactly. Symptoms, and, not root. And it's really, I think, psychedelic assisted therapy, the idea is to use your whole brain. You have this amazing brain, use it all, let the connections work, you know, keep the plasticity going. That's not what the antidepressants do or the anxiolytics, those drugs. And so it's a again, it's a fundamental shift in the way we would look at mental health. The other thing that's so interesting, me being a neuroscientist, is looking at it for neuroscience conditions like traumatic brain injury. Um, Parkinson's disease, dementia, chronic pain, stroke, those are all areas that are potential targets of the neuroplastogenic effects of psychedelics. So that's a whole other field that we can be exploring in the coming decades. What I also found fascinating, uh, Doctor, is the, the fact that uh, psilocybin, MDMA, because you said they're serotonin agonists or whatever, they're not addictive. You can't overdose at all on psilocybin, or you. But you can go. You can take way too much and have a, a bad trip or something. But you can't yes. overdose. Like nothing can happen to you. So you can overdose on psilocybin, LSD. You can certainly have a bad trip. You can do something really crazy. Like if you're not in a proper container, you can think you can fly and jump off a building and those sorts of things have happened, but not in these clinical trials that that is not happening. Um, there's some controversy over whether MDMA has some slight addictive potential because it's an amphetamine, to some degree, um, ketamine, which is a, you know, off label psychedelic, um, is addictive. It is addictive. Um, and so there is some precautions there, but the classic psychedelics have no addictive potential at all. Why would the ketamine, which can be addictive, we know Matthew Perry, you know, here in Hollywood, of you know, famous Friends actor, you know, got addicted to ketamine, everything else, but to, to ketamine, and he started taking street ketamine and getting it on his own, and it ultimately made him, you know, collapse in his hot tub, and he 
and he died. Why would ketamine be legal and um, and and something that's and it's addictive and something non-addictive like psilocybin is still considered a schedule one drug in America, like yes. heroin and and they treat it the same way, but it's not addictive. Yeah, go figure. That's it's, um, crazy. <clears throat> well, and you know, ketamine has been around a long time. It's a dissociative anesthetic. It's used a lot in hospitals and emergency rooms, and it's a very effective anesthetic. But at sub-anesthetic doses, um, it produces a, a psychedelic experience. Um, but it has an addictive angle to it as well. 